Welcome to the channel, my name's Rob, and in today's episode, we are going to look at how the USSR fell apart and some quirky things about the time as well. Please do make sure you like and subscribe if you enjoy this. Let's go. Du, 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 du. Greetings, comrades, and welcome to the Soviet Union. It's 1978 and things are going great. We were the first nation to suffocate a dog in geocentric <laughs> orbit, and we also set off the world's largest nuclear weapon. But those glory days are somewhat behind us now. Our vast empire may cover one sixth of the world's landmass, but most of it is an uninhabitable wasteland. This is the funny thing. Uh, Russia is huge, right? Russia is ginormous. But most of it is not inhabited. And, you know, I think you you really, realistically, I think you've got to get your impression to scale down a little bit what actually is habitable land. Because I don't think it's as scary as people think. I think a lot of it's just mouth and words. And to relax, guys, relax. We'll be fine. But hey, what the USSR lacks in beauty spots or arable land, it makes up for in fully automated luxury communism. I hope nothing ever changes. I have a reliable job working in a collective shoe factory, all the potatoes I could possibly <laughs> drink, and my first colour TV. It sure beats the old one that I watched through a magnifying glass. I can now clearly see what's happening across our empire of equality, and what our especially equal leaders are up to, and more importantly, what products they deem me worthy of. Because everything is created by state-run industry, nearly every advert is just letting me know about the local availability of certain products. Like this funky ski-themed number, telling me that lemons are here and they're fun for the whole family. Or That's a good point. Adverts in the USSR. Obviously over here it's all about capitalism, right? Adverts are about promoting something that someone wants to try and sell you. But when you basically get told what you can have and, and whatnot and everything's meant to be equal, what do they show as TV adverts? Now, obviously here he's saying, well, it's just stuff you can actually, you're allowed to have rather than what they're trying to necessarily sell you. But that's an interesting thought, how different TV adverts must be if they have adverts, but well, they must have. Or how about this one for our only available brand of washing detergent? I may never have seen a washing machine before, but now I can thanks to my trusty Ekran television set, and because of our dear leader, Leonid Brezhnev. I haven't seen him a lot on my television that lately, is and that is rumors that he's sick, but I'm sure he's just busy. After all, our brave Soviet troops are currently fighting extremists in Afghanistan, who you might know as the good guys from Rambo 3 or the bad guys from 9-11. I'm sure there'll be <laughs> no match for our mighty Red Army. I mean, they haven't been stockpiling nuclear weapons and guarding German concrete for nothing, right? Thanks to military overstretch and our barely functional factories, we don't have quite as many consumer products as people in the West, and the ones that are produced are usually snatched from the factories by corrupt officials before they even reach the shelves. So the only place that I see many of these products are on TV. Like this bizarrely erotic carpet advert that looks like it was filmed next to a load of sewage runoff. In 1982, I see Brezhnev on my screen again. He's alive and raring to go at our annual October Revolution March, which is confusingly held in November. And then we see what? Brezhnev again, just three weeks later, at his own funeral. But before his death was announced, the only thing that was on Soviet television was this. A four-hour loop of Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. It often gets played during times of political instability. That way our brave and intelligent leaders make sure that we get the correct information that they want us to hear. After Brezhnev went up to the great gulag in the sky, we were left with a bunch of leaders that looked about as fresh as the ones that we'd embalmed and put on public display in the 1920s. First comes Yuri Andropov, a familiar face, and plus his hairline was comforting as it was proof that something was recessing worse than our economy. He dies 15 months <laughs> into his leadership and then is replaced by the even older Konstantin Chernenko, seen here adopting the tea pose to assert dominance. But then he keels over just 13 months later. By it does seem like Russia has 
very similar looking leaders. You you could almost say if you had a lineup, like in, in prison, right? You have a lineup and you have to identify the Russian leader. I think it wouldn't be that difficult. I think most people would be pretty close because most of them do look the same. A lot of them have a bigger receding hairline than me. Uh, most of them are pretty old looking. They look a bit stern. That's my stern face. In 1985, we needed someone with some fresh blood. We were introduced to the new General Secretary of the Communist Party, the Gremlin in the Kremlin, Mikhail Gorbachev. At a sprightly 56, Gorby is young and his head is covered in ideas. <laughs> Maybe this guy can change things if he can get his plans approved by the country's real leaders, the KGB. KGB stands for Komitet Gosturovanoi Bezo Pastoyi. <laughs> they are a highly sophisticated secret police and surveillance network, employing over 500,000 people, including this handsome KGB agent who's currently stationed in East Germany. As well as spying on all of us, the KGB also has a specific department that's job is to ban Western media and foreign influence. But culture has a way of getting in through the cracks. Much of the Soviet Union's video work and commercials come from the same place, the satellite state of Estonia. And most of the ads that I'm showing you come from the mind of one crazed Estonian ad director, Harry Egypt. But the thing about Estonia is it's the one place in the Soviet Union where your television can pick up illegal frequencies from Finnish television stations. Meaning that television owning Estonians were some of the few who were able to actually access Western media with any kind of ease. It's, it's very similar to like North Korea now, isn't it? How a lot of things were banned. A lot of the Western shows and products were banned because they're seen as a, a bad influence. It's almost like this is, a, I'm sidetracking here, but we're basically, me and Charlie are watching a doc, well, not doc, sort of a documentary thing about polygamists. The, um, what are they called? Can't remember what they're called anyway. The polygamists in the United States. And they're run by these basically powerful leaders and they're funneling all the money from the government, but they don't want their members to know anything about the outside world. So they have their own schools, which is dodgy anyway. And it's it just reminding me of this. How do you, how do you stop thousands, millions of people from finding out things about the outside world. Surely it's almost impossible. And clearly it's explaining that that was almost the case where actually if you're in Estonia, it was pretty easy to, to pick up signals. And how are they going to be tracked? How, how is anyone going to know if you are watching telly and you're watching something you shouldn't be watching? I, I don't know. I, I'm not, I'm, it's actually technically, I'm saying technically, how can you? It's a question. Rhetorical probably. And Harry Egypt was clearly one of these people, because his commie commercials absolutely reek of the insidious influence of Western decadence. That's Western. But when Harry wasn't committing blatant plagiarism, he was at the local beach picking up models for his increasingly experimental commercials. Like this one, which is inexplicably trying to sell you shoe polish. My brain, my brain, my brain what? But he's probably best known in the West for this outrageous ear rape sequence, which is all about advertising the delicious taste of minced chicken carcass. What? Wasn't that great? <laughs> and perhaps our hip young leader Mikhail Gorbachev was watching these commercials when he decided to bring widespread reform to our nation. It was already perfect and he was about to improve it. The whole of the USSR got a light dusting of democracy as a few party officials were directly elected for the first time. They don't have much responsibility, but they exist. And this empowers ordinary people to feel like that they can actually criticize the current system. Not me, of course. I love it. <laughs> Gorbachev also allows a few foreign firms to set up business in the Soviet Union. 
I just going back to that, that's the thing, isn't it? It's that illusion of democracy. And, and people will say, oh, yeah, but it is democracy. It's an illusion. It's very convenient that Putin's opposition seemed to keep dying, right? And that, that is said, it's that illusion of, yes, your opinion matters when really it doesn't. You could say that technically about capitalism and democracy over here in Great Britain, but, you know, everything stays the same. But it's all a, an illusion. It's all that propaganda. It's It's making the people think what you want them to think without realising that they're thinking what you want them to think. And by 1986, I can even see adverts for that dirty capitalist swill water. Oh, I don't Pepsi. like Pepsi. But I wouldn't buy it, even if I could afford it. I'd rather just sit back, relax, and watch Russia's longest running animated show, Well, Just You Wait, in which a chain smoking wolf attempts and fails to devour the same big eyed bunny. But he's usually outwitted by our nation's superior manufacturing prowess or our honourable secret police. Hey, what's going on? That's Tom and Jerry. An official announcement from the Council of Ministers. There has been an accident at the Chernobyl Atomic Power Station. One of the atomic reactors was damaged. The consequences of the accident are being taken care of. Huh. Well, that was short. I'm sure they've got everything under control. Back to the ads. Chernobyl. <laughs> Oh, come on, that one was good. Three days later, we're told that everything's under control and that foreign reports of the death count have been greatly exaggerated. See, nothing to worry about. The lesson here is that you can solve any problem if you throw enough helicopters and human suffering at it. The level of the radiation in the area of the power station and the immediately adjacent area still remains dangerous to the health of people. The highest priority task right now is to eliminate the consequences of the accident. Huh. You know, I'm starting to think these fuckers are lying to me. The Chernobyl <laughs> disaster really undermined confidence in the Soviet Union, both internally and externally. On top of that, we're still fighting in Afghanistan. Apparently, someone armed those extremists with a bargain bucket of anti-aircraft missiles. And now I think about it generally, this whole communism thing is starting to look a little... creaky. I watch commercials for cars and speedboats that I'll never be able to afford. I don't really feel like going to work, and a lot of people agree with me. I'd rather just sit back and watch TV. And there, I can see that some of my countrymen are being a bit more proactive. Because, I mean, if you're not working, I guess you might as well be protesting. There are strikes and demonstrations across the Soviet Union, especially in the Baltic states like Estonia. But unlike our previous leaders, Gorby isn't as enthusiastic about transforming protesters into a cloud of pink mist. With uprisings going conspicuously uncrushed, people are emboldened. On TV, I even get to see someone directly heckle Gorbachev. Yo, fuck 12, fuck the KGB. And I'm also seeing a lot more of this guy, a barely functional alcoholic known as Boris Yeltsin, who now holds public office in Moscow. He doesn't have much real power, but that's probably a good thing because he's always about two bottles deep. But I like what this Boris has <laughs> that's to Russians, say, isn't it? so do a lot of people, including these guys. In the same year that the USSR triumphantly retreated from Afghanistan, it also shrewdly decided to let protesters tear down the Berlin Wall. And we're all pretty much glad to see it go. That thing was an eyesore. It was also really expensive to run. And, you know, freedom, openness, blah, 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 whatever. After being drip-fed capitalism for the better part of a decade, we were ready for the all-you-can-eat buffet. Moscow got its first McDonald's in 1990. And it drew crowds that we hadn't seen since that morning's breadline. But the boys over at the KGB weren't as excited about all these reforms. They started seeing their central power getting sapped away, and they blamed Gorbachev. Gorbachev, apparently, I'm no expert, so it's only little bits that I've learned previously. But obviously, Gorbachev was the start, right, of the breakdown of, of Soviet Union. It was the breakdown, and, and actually, it's a good thing in some sense. Obviously, it's still hard work at the moment, but there's only so much you can do, especially now in these days with the technology, social media, the internet. It must be so difficult Think back then, it was just TVs, but now it, it must be so difficult to stop people, young people even, exploring the world around them, exploring different ideas to what 
they've been taught because mobile phones, you can buy mobile phones, right? Even in Russia, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it's so easy to access information. I think it's, it's, it's never been easier, has it? And therefore, you know, you try and stop people finding things out. You know, it's it's not easy. It really wouldn't be easy. And therefore, how are you going to keep this regime that basically is trying to enforce their own beliefs and, you know, limit people, limit people's thoughts? Hey, and maybe they had a point. Maybe we were all a little overstimulated from all these new products and to be honest, that chicken advert probably didn't help. Maybe what we all needed was another continuous loop of Swan Lake. This is what is playing on every television in the Soviet Union as the KGB and the Red Army do what Russia does best. A good old fashioned coup. They join forces specifically to take us back to the glory days of gulags and gout. When the news returns, Gorbachev is nowhere to be seen. And it's pretty difficult for the newsreaders to pretend everything is normal when there are hundreds of tanks rolling on Red Square. When our new leaders show themselves, they look like a bunch of grey suited clones. They tell us that Gorby has come down with a nasty case of coup. I mean, flu. <laughs> no one takes these people seriously. They're anonymous. They're nobodies. I haven't seen them on my TV before, but I have seen this guy. On the day of the coup, Boris Yeltsin sobered up for long enough to jump on a tank in Red Square and give a rousing speech. <laughs> He calls for an open-ended general strike to protest the coup, which suited me because I stopped going to work years ago. <laughs> Just three days later, the coup fails. Gorbachev is back and he's appearing alongside Yeltsin. But everything is different now. The center cannot hold. On Christmas Day 1991, it's over. Despite all his reforms, Mikhail Gorbachev resigns from office in disgrace but he does get to live every underappreciated worker's dream and set fire to the whole place on his way out. <laughs> he announces the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the rise of the Russian Federation. The Soviet flag is lowered from the Kremlin for the last time. I watch this ritual on TV and it's strange to outlive the country you were born into. Like watching the walls of your childhood bedroom dissolve into air. Surely after this, Nothing can be the same. Greetings fellow capitalist pigs, welcome to the Russian Federation. It's 1998 and things are going great. Our currency might be worthless, but we're propping up our economy by pumping dinosaur sauce out of Siberia and dumping guns off the coast of Liberia. I haven't been seeing much of our brave president Boris Yeltsin on TV recently. There's rumours that he's sick, but I'm sure he's just busy. The last time I saw him, he was getting loaded with some American pervert. Even the KGB got into the capitalist swing of things. Doing a successful rebrand in the mid-90s, they're now known as the FSB and are led by this guy. What's his name? Wait, actually, he's Prime Minister now. But life moves pretty fast in capitalist Russia. We've now got more luxury brands than you can shake a stick at. Only the oligarchs can afford them, but at least I can see them on my new Japanese TV. And I can see commercials for American businesses like Pizza Hut. But I'll admit, I do have some nostalgia for the old days, but wait, wait a minute, is that? Gorby, it's you. Wow, life is good. What more could I possibly want? I hope nothing ever changes well that was quite a nice rundown of the end of the soviet union wasn't it in a fun whimsical way the funny thing is though you know what appears to change also stays the same right you've gone from controlling a mad a mad society where you are not allowed to do things and you and you're restricted and now you look at today where Putin has had his way for a very long time and still has these far right views of control and power. That's what it is. It's all about power. And as I said earlier, you see what happens to people that oppose Putin. They normally seem to kick the bucket and it doesn't end well for them because it's that illusion of, of democracy. Um, and it is, it's, oh, it's just strange, isn't it? How things, like I said, how things 
say they change, but look the same. That would be my certainly, that would certainly be my take from it. It's, um, it's, it's, it's scary to think actually that, you know, you th think that positive things are happening and they're probably not, you know, life just carries on the same way. Um, but there are people, there are plenty of Russians that don't agree with the way things are being run. Um, I've just, you know, just in the news the other day, you hear about protests and, and, protests happening in Russia and, and people standing up against the current regime, which is great to hear, but they're putting their lives at risk for the greater good. Well, that was interesting. Thank you so much for joining me. If you enjoyed it, please do make sure you like and subscribe. Go check out the original video with the original channel as well. And I will catch you next time.